This week, what the papers say is presented by Peter Patterson. Good evening. After all the rumours, the leaks, the informed guesses, and the uninformed guesses, the cruise missiles finally arrived at Greenham Common Air Base on Monday, just, it seems, when no one was expecting them. Even the patient Greenham Common women continuing their vigil outside the barbed wire were taken by surprise, something the Daily Telegraph headlined the next morning. Cruise missiles arrive. Peace women taken by surprise. Reporter Charles Lawrence, I must say, added a surprise of his own, so far as I was concerned. After months of often noisy protest, the women peace campaigners camped outside the base could think of little to say and nothing to do. Odd that, given the articulate record of the Greenham women and their determination to hinder movement in and out of the base, not to mention the final paragraph of Lawrence's own story. Last night, as the sun set and a northerly wind cut across the base, there were about 200 women to join a candlelit vigil and huddle round their campfires. Twenty-one were arrested, mainly for obstructing roads. Nothing to do, huh? Nevertheless, whether from boredom, from over-anticipation, or an incorrigibly hostile attitude to the peace movement, there was a sense of anticlimax in the news stories. Crows is here, said the Daily Express, in unison with the sun. Crows is here. The male's headline baffled me somewhat. Crews, dawn of an era. Now, whether you believe that the cruise missiles represent the most tangible threat of Armageddon we've yet seen, or an essential balance to the SS-20s pointed at us by the Russians, it's still a little difficult in a world stuffed with nuclear weapons already to discern the male's new era. Perhaps the headline was based on a remark by Defence Secretary Michael Heseltine. The NATO deployment is planned to be completed over a five-year period. It can be halted, modified or reversed at any time if results in Geneva warrant it. If that happened, it would certainly justify New Dawn headlines in all the papers. But in the meantime, the rows over defence will go on, and while he's permitted to remain as General Secretary of CND, Monsignor Bruce Kent will be in the middle of them. One's obliged to use the phrase, while he's permitted to remain, since the Monsignor is still a Roman Catholic priest, and therefore answerable to Cardinal Basil Hume, Archbishop of Westminster. This link always gives the papers something to beat the Monsignor over the head with. This week he went, in their eyes, over the top by choosing to address the Congress of the British Communist Party and heaping praise upon them. Here's the Communist Morning Star. CND leader praises communist role. Partners in peace. And here's how the rest of Fleet Street saw it. First, the mail. My debt to the Reds. Monsignor Bruce Kent, the CND leader, marked Remembrance Sunday by praising the communists as a force for peace. The Express gave Bruce Kent the same treatment with even more loaded language. Storm erupts as CND priest praises Reds. Observers from Iron Curtain countries were delighted as the champion of one-sided nuclear disarmament told the cheering comrades, It's a pleasure to be here. The Daily Star's condemnation came on its front page, ahead of the actual news story on page two. A message from the Daily Star and the people of Britain. Quite a claim. To Monsignor Kent. For God's sake, belt up. What the papers want to see, of course, is Cardinal Hume ordering Monsignor Kent to give up his full-time job in CND and get back to something, well, more pastoral in a traditional sense. I even felt a faint echo of old Lord Beaverbrook's Bible-thumping Protestantism in the express leader writer's injunction. Is it not time that Monsignor Kent stopped praising the communists and went back to his altar to praise the Lord? Keith Waterhouse today cut through the cant and told us why he thinks Bruce Kent is a gift to the right-wing press and the government. From the Tories' point of view, I would have thought that Monsignor Kent would be just about the best CND leader they could hope for, always assuming Arthur Scargo were unavailable. He so consistently sets the cats among the peace doves that he ought to be funded with Esseltine gold. Talking of gold, let's move on to the most spectacular get-rich-quick scheme yet devised by the newspapers, and I don't mean the dubious lotteries being run by the Express and the Mail to give each of their readers a thousand million to one chance of becoming a millionaire. We were alerted to what's going on by Michael Davey in his column in The Observer way back in September. The name of Reuters used to be honoured everywhere as synonymous with the highest journalistic standards. It was a news service that, since it was started by Baron Reuter in the middle of the last century, had built up an immaculate reputation for accuracy and objectivity. In future, it seems likely to be known for the way it suddenly turned into El Dorado. Reuters is about to float its shares on the stock market and stockbrokers are saying they may be worth a billion pounds. Not a million, but a billion, 1,000 million pounds. Reuters struck gold when it started recently supplying financial and market information to private subscribers, as distinct from its role of simply supplying news for publication. So who's on to the winner? Assuming that Reuters is valued at a billion, Lord Matthews of Fleet Holdings, Daily Express, Daily Star, etc., will get 120 million pounds. Lord Rothermere of Associated Newspapers, Daily Mail, etc., will get £120 million. And Mr. Rupert Murdoch, Sun, News of the World, Times, etc., will get at least £90 million. None of these men is noted for urging his editors to follow the principles that made Reuters internationally respected. 
Michael Davies' piece was followed by an embarrassed silence from the rest of Fleet Street. Until, a month later, the tiny spectator produced a long piece written jointly by lawyer Geoffrey Robertson and editor Alexander Chancellor. Reuters, the price of greed. Mr Chancellor has something of a personal interest in the Reuter affair. His father is the former head of the agency, and he himself has worked for it as a journalist. What they unearthed was the Reuters Trust. This agreement, on the face of it, prevents the newspaper owners from selling their shares and prevents Reuters being floated on the stock exchange. The Lord Chief Justice has to be consulted on any change whatsoever in the terms of the Reuter Trust. By its terms, the parties are pledged to regard their respective shareholdings of shares in Reuters as in the nature of a trust rather than an investment. They undertake to ensure that Reuters shall at no time pass into the hands of any one interest group or faction. To preserve fully its integrity, independence and freedom from bias. And to exert every effort to expand Reuters. In order to maintain in every event its position as the leading world news agency. Trustees were appointed to ensure these terms were enforced. Who these trustees are and whether they can possibly be relied upon to fulfil their obligations, we shall go into in a moment. But right from its start, the Trust had an additional inbuilt safeguard. Its formation in 1941 followed a parliamentary debate which argued for Reuters to be incorporated along the same lines as the BBC. The wartime Fleet Street proprietors stepped in with the Trust involving a shareholding plan to avoid this. To allay parliamentary anxieties, under Clause 12 of the Trust, no party to it can transfer any stock or shares in Reuters held by it without destroying the entire Trust. So, before any shares can be transferred or the Trust wound up, proposals have to be submitted to the Lord Chief Justice of England, currently Lord Lane, who can only approve if he's satisfied that by reason of the circumstances then existing, it is impracticable to secure the objects of the agreement by continuing its operations in its then existing or any amended form. It all looks reasonably watertight, doesn't it? But with a thousand million pounds to be made, such petty obstacles are apparently not to be allowed to stand in the way of the shareholders cashing in. Nor are those shareholders only newspaper proprietors. Some work for Reuters, but Alexander Chancellor has unearthed the extraordinary fact that only a handful of Reuters employees have been allocated shares by the company. We know that out of a total of 3,205 Reuters employees throughout the world, 124 people, mostly in London and New York, have been allowed to buy shares, of which the combined value is put by the Capital Taxes Office of the Inland Revenue in agreement with the company's accountants at nearly £20 million. So what's in it for those who got in at the start? When the first employee shares were issued in December 1981, they were valued at £147 each. Their latest valuation, based on the 1982 balance sheet, is £6,450 each, an appreciation of nearly 4,300%. The spectator underlined the envy all this has created. It is hardly surprising, under these circumstances, that the people in Reuters who have shares do not particularly care to talk about it with colleagues who don't. For a graphic illustration of what difference this can make to an individual's bank account, take Reuters managing director Mr Glenn Renfrew, who, according to Chancellor, has 545 shares. At £6,450 each, that comes to... Three million five hundred and fifteen thousand pounds. But how is the board of Reuters tackling the apparent obstacles of the trust agreement to such enrichment? Simple. They don't accept that they're bound by it. According to the news agency's financial director and secretary, Mr. Nigel Judah, I think if you have unanimous agreement among shareholders, whether they have a shareholders agreement or something else, that agreement can be modified. Hold it there. Let's see whether I've got it straight. I think Nigel Judah is saying that if everyone agrees to break the promises made in the trust then it can be changed with impunity. With all the careless rapture of someone who sees £1,000 million in the offing and with his own personal shares worth nearly £2 million, Mr Judah could tell the Telegraph that... With agreement of shareholders, the trust could be modified, but its objectives would remain intact. But what about the Lord Chief Justice and the other elaborate safeguards? The Observer last Sunday consulted Alexander's father, Sir Christopher Chancellor, who drew up the original trust deed along with former Times editor Sir William Haley. Said Chancellor... It had always been intended the document should be legally binding. The Observer pointed out... This contradicts claims by the Reuters board last week that the 42-year-old trust never had any legal standing. Reuters are now involved in a growing parliamentary controversy over plans to tear up the trust agreement on the grounds that it was never legally valid. So now the argument appears to have shifted. It's no longer that they can do what they like because they all appear to agree to disagree with the founding principles of the trust. Now the argument seems to be that the trust agreement itself isn't valid. It sounds to me a bit as though the board of our most prestigious wire service has got its wires crossed. 
Anyway, the lack of validity argument would enable the trustees to sell shares cooperatively owned by British newspapers and make between 1,000 million and 1,500 million pounds on the stock market. You notice the hint there that the shares might be worth half as much again as the billion originally anticipated. So what about the trustees, the body of men who exist to see that the terms of the right of trust are fulfilled? There's the rub. They're known to include not only the obstinate Sir Christopher Chancellor, but also the two biggest beneficiaries of a stock exchange flotation, Lord Matthews of the Express Group and Lord Rothermere of the Mail. This week, the trustees at last decided to speak out. Yesterday's Telegraph carried their statement, issued by their chairman, uh, Mr. Anglis McLaughlin. I wish I could quote all of it, for it's a brilliant parody of those communiques from, from Lord Nome, which appear in private eye. My fellow trustees and I have noted with some surprise the public controversy that has arisen in the United Kingdom concerning a possible capital reconstruction of Reuters and its subsequent public flotation as if it were something over which we as trustees have no control. It has been inferred that since we were all in the first place nominated by newspaper companies, that we shall rubber stamp anything that is formally proposed by the board. Mr. McLaughlin is happy to disabuse us. On the contrary. When any scheme is presented to us, we shall seek independent legal advice as to whether that scheme is one with which we as trustees should concur. Until then, I, on behalf of my fellow trustees, do not intend to make any further statement. Well, my humble fivers on rubber stamp in the colours of Lords Matthews and Rothermere coming in at odds of 5,000 to 1 at next spring's Stock Exchange Cup meeting. But on to more important matters with the off-throne dramas of the royal family. We've had this from the sun. 20 things you don't know about tiny Prince William. Or maybe didn't even want to know. Like fact 20. When he goes out to play, William usually wears a pair of little red plastic wellies, similar to those on sale at chain stores throughout Britain. Really? How interesting. No wonder... The Sun is the best-read newspaper in the House of Commons. An MP revealed yesterday. Just what we'd all gloomily suspected. But it was the Daily Mirror that got through my defences with this sentimental story. Diana and the Little Old Lady. Exclusive by Edward Vale. Loyally refusing to divulge the location, the Mirror reported... Princess Diana regularly visits an elderly woman who lives in a tiny terraced house. It is one of Diana's best-kept secrets. And she looked taken aback when she was spotted leaving the house in a London suburb yesterday. She said... I have been to see an old lady friend. A helpful neighbour supplied vital information. I have heard that an old age pensioner up the road has visits from a titled lady, but I don't know who it is. The people around here keep themselves very much to themselves. But all the warmth and affection that story inspired in me was cruelly dissipated by this apology a day or so later. Diana and the Mirror. The Daily Mirror published a story on page one on Saturday about the Princess of Wales visiting a little old lady in London. In fact, the princess was attending a private dance lesson. The Daily Mirror apologizes for the error. The Mail on Sunday told us a little more. On time, in shape, the dancing princess. On Friday, Princess Diana enjoyed an energetic aerobics workout at the South London studio of Royal Ballet director Merle Park. She was not visiting a little old lady, as reported by a newspaper. I should think not. And I think the Mirror should have apologised to Merle Park. Far from being an old-age pensioner in need of a charitable visit from a titled lady, who's who gives Miss Parks age as 46? Good night.